Thank you. As was said in the introduction, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, I have chosen to intervene, rather deliver this talk on what I have written here on top of the text as there is neither legal nor moral justification for UNHRC war crime probes in Sri Lanka. Since the time is very limited, I would rather rattle off the most important points and the full text is available if someone wants to get it later via email or in any other way. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to make a preliminary remark that is very dear to me every time I talk about world politics in my ethics classes, and in particular with regard to our Sri Lankan national issue. Some of you who are familiar with my writings would know that I have been saying this ad infinitum without end, namely, about this concept of international community, in inverted commas, international community. We can't have today any discussion of world, on world politics without using this phrase international community. My first question is, when there is legitimately established United Nations organization, of which our friend here, Dr. Kohona was the permanent representative and many others who were involved in it. Why should we need this parallel group called international community? It's my contention, I would rather read because I tend to talk too much if I don't limit myself to the text. I would read what I have written, it's more accurate. I would like to clarify at the very outset that this term is nothing but a dignified term coined by the Western nations, led by the United States of America. I have nothing against USA personally. I go there for lectures every year, so there's nothing against them. But with regard to politics, this is a fact. It's a, international community is a term that they have coined together with the other Western allies to refer to themselves and thus camouflage their activities of hegemony all over the post-Cold War world, all over the post-superpower world. This clarification or the description of mine as to what international community is, is substantiated by the fact, dear friends, in this international community, so-called international community, every time we hear on uh, television or newspaper articles or wherever, even in learned erudite articles, international community has decided Sri Lanka should do this. International community has been willing to do this in Syria, Iraq or wherever. Please tell me, who are the members of this international community and who has the clout Will India or Nigeria or for that matter Cuba or some other country be in that international community? I mean, who are this international community? And very often, I, I can't remember who it was, I think it was Ms. Rambukwal who first said, or I don't know whether it was Natasha, someone said, we forget. We like to get confused in Sinhalese, excuse me, for using Sinhalese, as Bandung. It's a sort of a just international community. So international community has, who is this international community? I, I want to take the bull by the horns, by its horns first. So let's be very clear that this term international community is nothing but a term coined by those interested parties to refer to themselves. It's a dignified term, apparently. I'll first, I have divided into three, rather four, three major parts. First part is to say there is no legal justification for this UNHRC-sponsored 
uh, rather Sri Lanka co-sponsored, etc., etc. There is no legal justification. Dear friends, for the past 20 years I have been lecturing, not only in Rome but elsewhere in the world, on ethics before talking about Christian ethics, on warfare, violence, of late terrorism. Unfortunately, I have not come across any author, author or any school that has given acceptable practical norms to cover a fight against terrorism. What we normally do is the easy thing. We use the conventional warfare, the so-called just war criteria, which has become part of international law. We use them. But it is faulty. It's a great, grave error. We are not talking about, so many of you spoke to me before, the, before this session began, and some of you who were involved in the war, and some of us who knew about it, we know a fight against terrorism is very different from a conventional war. So how can you apply the norms of a conventional war to a war against terrorism. Of course, you might say, where there is no norm, we have to use what is available, well and good. But then we have to be very cautious about it. Very cautious. Of course, I am one of those who insist, whether it is war against terrorism or war against anybody, we have to respect the basic human norm the basic human norm is, any civilized nation would agree, not to do damage or kill non-combatant uh, civilians, uh, non-combatant immunity. So that's valid, as far as possible. Even in the conventional just war doctrine, as most of you would know, there was this allowance made for collateral damage. So, how come that when it comes to war against the most ruthless terrorist organization in the world, this is not what I say, it's what the FBI said long ago, if you remember. So how come that Sri Lanka is targeted uh, as if we have violated an existing norm? Uh, then I want to also say, I'm still in the section to point out that there is no legal justification. I want to say we are dealing exclusively here of an internal affair of a country. Now this has been also politicized. I don't know whether it was Natasha or Mr. Ramukwala who said it. It's an internal affair of a country. Of course it has become external thanks to some of our politicians and thanks to the so many so-called refugees who went to other countries. But this is an internal affair. My second point with regard to establish that there is no legal justification is to say how come that it is very good, I live half the year in Europe, in those countries, especially after that attack in Nice in France, even in Italy, Rome where I live, strict security measures are implemented and rightly so. Very often when I go by metro I am frightened with all my big talk as we were here. So they have every right to enact norms, take measures to protect the citizenry. Good. But my, I go a little beyond. Every legitimate government, in other words, has a right and duty to protect its innocent civilians. So from the most ruthless terrorist organization in the world, when there was daily damage here to human life and to public property, the government or the governments during that period had that right and duty. I said, I'm going a little beyond. It was just the other day, I think was it in June or July, I can't remember, that report of Sir John Chilcott was out on British involvement in Iraq. This is not a Sri Lankan report or Mahinda Rajapaksha government report. Because that's the way, you no know, people are classified. Someone said, it was Natasha, that immediately when you say something, you are pro this one or pro that, anti that one. 
The point is, John Chilcott report clearly established that, among other things, that Tony Blair was wrong in leading Britain to war, all that is okay. For my purposes, I would say, it also said something interesting. The Islamic State triggered off, thanks to that unjust aggression of the West, United States and Britain. It's not only John Chilcott who said it. There have been so many other writings, well established. Now, my argument is here. It's all right for those nations to get out of their territories, boundaries, and go and fight in other people's sovereign territories. There was in other countries like Afghanistan, now Syria, Libya, Iraq. And kill thousands of people, but it's not right for Sri Lanka legally to fight her own terrorist organization inside the country. Please don't, we have to get out, whoever said it at the beginning, one of these uh, pretty ladies said at the beginning, that don't classify people if you want to have a good argument. What is true is true even if it comes from the devil. I'm a Catholic priest, so I'm talking about devil. What is true is true. So, I think I have to be watchful of my time limit. Uh, it is established that nearly at the time Britain withdrew from Iraq, Iraq is only one case, some 150,000 Iraqi civilians had died. But then I had access, thanks to one of my doctoral students in Rome, to this Lancet survey conducted by John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in the year 2006, suggested some 654,965. Now these are only figures. Immediately someone might say, look here, these are only subjective figures. How come that they become subjective figures when they touch those nations, but about this 40,000 died during the war, 60,000, one of our own prelates saying, <laughs> Catholic prelates, I don't want to mention names here, 55,000 died and all that, maybe. How come those figures are all right? Do you mean to say that human lives in Sri Lanka are less worthy than human lives in those countries? I mean, these, these are things we need to answer. Also, I want to refer to, how many minutes more for me? Yeah, I, I'll take about six minutes. But uh, She said five, I said six. I want to refer you to a well-known writer who is very dear to me, Noam Chomsky, the American writer. He was very popular in the 1980s when I was a doctoral student. Chomsky said at that time, he was still writing during the super power era, Cold War era, he said, mass media normally categorizes different nations as client states and enemy states. If someone is killed in a client state, friendly state of the West, if someone is killed by the client states, that is an unworthy killing, not worthy being reported in the papers. But if someone is killed in a so-called enemy state, that's a worthy killing. Ex-Prime Minister of India, Manmohan Sen, when Mumbai attack took place a few years ago, he made a terrific speech in Parliament. I still remember that. He said, there cannot be good terrorists and bad terrorists. You see, when we fight them, they are good. When someone, This is pure relativism. So, there is no legal ju uh, justification for some people who have created a trail of blood, some people, by that I mean the so-called international community, that is the Western nations, to be precise, to do that and to tell us, here I slowly move on to moral justification, to tell us that what we did inside our country is unfair. It was just the other day, the new Prime Minister of Britain, Theresa May, said, 
let John Chilcott or any Chilcott say anything. We are not going to have any inquiry about British role in Iraq. No, and the same was said by David Cameron in January this year, before this Brexit. Now my question is, for them, no inquiry. For something they did in someone else's country, there's a double violation here, taking human life and violating the sovereignty of other nations. But when it comes to Sri Lanka, Britain was one of the most vociferous, I don't know whether I'm right, the most vociferous that there should be an inquiry. So what moral right have these people to say this? Having said that there's no legal right, I want to say what moral right they have. Lastly, to, uh, for anybody interested, I'll send, there's a lot of detail, but I want to be within the time limit. We need to be very careful, dear ladies and gentlemen, when we accuse someone of certain things. To accuse someone of war crimes is a serious matter. And still worse, of genocide. Do we know how loaded negatively these terms are? Genocide. That means, let's say I'm just cooking up, I don't know half of this audience personally, let's say this line here, they belong to a certain race. And I, the dictator or whoever of this country, I isolate them, persecute them, go after them, their descendants, and just to eliminate them. Did such a thing happen in Sri Lanka? So when you say genocide, and coming from no less a person than the UN Secretary General, recently, when he compares Sri Lanka, this is the biggest insult as a Sri Lankan that I have faced, and I'm going to deal with it in my writings, to say that, to put us with Rwanda and Bosnia, in those countries, what happened? And what are we talking? So, that's one. The other one is, Dr. Rajan Hool, the well-known uh, intellectual, recently at his speech on celebrating the life of Alva Pillay Rajasingham, uh, 22nd September, exactly a week ago, he referred to how the army separated during the last phase of war. Civilians and tried to save them, even the group that the LTT was keeping as human shields. So, how can you talk about genocide? How can you talk about... Let's be careful, therefore, uh, when we use such terms. Last point I want to cover is the enigmatic role played by the present Sri Lankan government. First of all, I don't think any Sri Lankan government, whether MR government or MS Vikramasinghe government or any government in future, need to bend backwards as the present government has bent backwards. I mean, please correct me later, I will be clearing off in a little while, at least through a note, any of you will be free to correct me. I'm making this statement. I don't think any nation which fought a terrorist organization within its own soil has later gone and co-sponsored a resolution. I mean, This, 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 is, this is just, excuse me if I become passionate, because I love my country, so, uh, co-sponsoring. Co-sponsoring again, passe hanave sponsor ko keela. That's a different matter. Uh, uh, instead of, I say that I'll stop here. Uh, I'll read this, please. Uh, oh, yeah. Instead of keeping our independence and dignity as a nation, Instead of taking a firm stand that respects our sovereignty, independence and dignity as a nation, yes, while resorting to restorative justice in the post-war period, I must admit, I see Mr. Rajapakshi is also present here, I must admit, the previous government was a little slow, even to my annoyance, in implementing even LLRC proposals they may have had their reasons. In that sense, we quoted some of the things that happened later. But it does not mean that we have to go and bend backwards 
bow down on our knees and then co-sponsor. I will enumerate four reasons, four consequences of this co-sponsoring, and I will stop there. First of all, this co-sponsoring would imply that our own government, our own nation as a whole, has no confidence in our own judiciary. It can affect our integrity as a nation in the long run. Secondly, since the so-called international community, which is a term for Western nations, has been biased against Sri Lanka right from the start. You mentioned, you can ask questions later, you mentioned one moment when they were not biased against, it, against us. Since they were biased, when you have this hybrid court and all that, that they co-sponsored, can we expect a fair judgment, fair, fair inquiry? Thirdly, this co-sponsoring of the Geneva Resolution is a voluntary submission of ourselves to be a colony in the new world order of neo-colonialism. Fourthly, will UNHRC resolution, now this is serious. I'm a Catholic priest. I'm one of those who is involved in promoting peace. Will UNHRC resolution promote peace this co-sponsored resolution, will it promote peace in the long run or will it renew our wounds and divide us further? What we need now is restorative justice, not retributive justice. As someone said, I think Natasha said, model, uh, a certain model that worked in Alaska or in South Africa may not be our model. We are having 2,500 years of history, civilization. They need not tell us how to run our country. Last point there, last negative impact will be, this decision to co-sponsor may have one beneficiary, namely those who co-sponsored it. In the long run, their political stability may be assured. In the long run, they may be given financial and other aid. But what a price we as a nation have to pay. It is like, I'm not a married man, it's like giving my daughter for prostitution just to get certain favors. Thank you and God bless you. <laughs>